Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship with Ramona Avenue Christian Church. It is good to gather in this place at this time and to worship God and commune with God and one another. Um, you may notice things look a little bit different this morning. We have some flowers, some beautiful new flowers, and these are a gift to us uh, in memory of Leslie Caffey, who is a longtime member of this church, who on this coming Tuesday, so two days from now, would have been 100 years old. So, um, and uh, got a lovely card that came with it that kind of matches the flowers, actually. It's kind of beautiful. Um, so, let me read the card. There's a quote from Thornton Wilder. It says, what is essential does not die, but clarifies. The highest tribute to those we have loved and lost is not grief, but gratitude. And then it says, in loving memory of Leslie Caffey, wife, mother, grandmother, sister, and mentor, we are eternally grateful. Signed, Phil Hunter, Alan Caffey, and Bert Caffey. So thank you to the Caffey family for this gift of uh, flowers, and we we chose to uh, go with ones that will last so that we can use these year after year, um, part of Leslie's uh, memory and legacy. And uh, I love the colors. I don't know. Yeah, very nice. So, so happy birthday, Leslie. Uh, heavenly birthday uh, on Tuesday. Uh, today's service, we will be taking uh, communion as usual, so if you have something to eat, something to drink, uh, invite us to share together later in the service. And with that, um, invite us to sing together the Lord's Prayer. Church, as we come to our time of prayer today, uh, there are plenty of things to be on our hearts and minds um, in this season of the year. Um, we uh, have an election coming up in less than two months now, right? Um, so praying for wisdom and praying for things to come together and turn out as they should. Amen? <laughs> and a um, couple other things I have here. Um, Mike was telling me just before the service, I hadn't heard about this, but uh, in Kenya, in uh, East Africa, there was a uh, discovery of, apparently, of uh, this doomsday cult where people um, were killing one another and themselves, and they found over 400 um, bodies, and the cult leader is now on trial. Um, 
Did I get did I get the basics? Okay. So we'll be praying for people of Kenya, particularly those affected by this directly and indirectly, those family members, maybe folks who have escaped, and all those um, victimized by this cult leader. And uh, this is what happens when people uh, use religion without accountability and uh, without input from others' people, when they focus on their own interpretation of things and uh, don't account for others. This is how we end up with cults. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, uh, you've been hearing about Springfield, Ohio a lot in the, in the news this week. Um, I'm from Springfield, Ohio. So I uh, actually grew up just outside of Springfield, a tiny little town called Enon, which our joke was that you, it's nun spelled backwards because um, <laughs> it's E-N-O-N. But uh, my parents live in Springfield, Ohio right now. And um, according to my mom, who, again, resident of Springfield, Ohio, it's malicious gossip was the phrase she used, I think, um, about what's going on there. Uh, there have been Haitian refugees and immigrants coming into Springfield for a number of years now. My parents have been telling me about it. Um, some of them attend the same church where my parents go. And uh, uh, in fact, I, she shared with me a, um, a piece that PBS NewsHour did. Uh, it's about a 10-minute piece. It was really well done on Springfield, Ohio, and the Haitian immigration and different reactions within the city. Um, you know, some business leaders saying these are the best workers we've ever had. We, I wouldn't, you know, we need the work. We need people who could come in and take these jobs. And then other people saying, but they're straining our resources. And, you know, the city has grown by, I think, 20% or something over the last, you know, several years. So that's, you know, that is going to create some, some needs and, you know, growth like that. But, uh, uh, Nobody's eating cats or dogs. It's not, it's just not true. It's a racist lie, xenophobic lie, and we need to call it out for what it is. And that's what it is. Um, in the PBS NewsHour piece, uh, they actually interview a couple people at my parents' church. Uh, one of them is the uh, guy who runs the soundboard, who was one of the earliest uh, Haitian immigrants, I guess, to Springfield, and um, yeah, you know, it's really interesting to hear him talk about you know coming there for opportunities for jobs and and then uh, hoping someday to go back home if things if the country is able to stabilize. But um, if you've watched the news, part of the reason why people are coming from Haiti to the U.S. and to places like Springfield, Ohio, is that there's uh, the, the president was uh, assassinated a couple years ago, and ever since then, the country has just been in chaos. And gangs kind of just fighting to, to, uh, for control of the, of the country and the capital. Um, it's just really been a, a horrible situation. And so um, these are not illegal immigrants. These are people coming seeking asylum and being granted asylum, coming here as refugees. Um, so it has nothing to do with the southern border. It has nothing to do with illegal immigration. It has nothing to do with those things. And it has nothing to do with people's pets. Um, so there you go. Take it from somebody who grew up there, whose parents still live there, and their church is involved with people there. They also support a lot of... There's a... My parents know um, one of the, oh, this guy is, he kind of heads up um, a lot of the efforts to help folks get uh, settled in Springfield and get them some of the basic, you know, supplies they need, get them set up in apartments and things. And, and um, there's this whole kind of social um, network that's, that's built up to help folks to adjust to life. In, in Springfield, Ohio, and my parents know the guy. They said he's a stand-up guy. He's been doing really good work, and their church has been 
um, supporting the efforts. So. so we could be praying for Springfield, though, because this week they had to close down the city hall, uh, at least one other building, uh, which I'm forgetting, and uh, at least one of the schools they sent the kids home early because of bomb threats. And apparently now there have been far-right groups uh, coming into the city from outside protesting and uh, there have been continued uh, threats and so on. So this stuff is, these things have consequences. Right? Words have consequences. Um, and J.D. Vance is a senator of Ohio, one of the senators, and he should know better than to spread this kind of stuff. Um, and as an as a uh, someone who grew up in Ohio, I'm I'm ticked off and a bit ashamed about all that. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll, that's enough about that. Um, what else should we be praying about and for? Okay, so continue prayers for Kathy Hernandez, uh, Mike's um, friend's wife, who's going through all the, the rigmarole and post-op and hoping that the, that the surgery did what it needed to and that, it, that everything is clear. I know I mentioned this last Sunday, but um, this past Monday, my dad turned 80. So praise God, he made it that far. And uh, apparently he was just showered with cards. Uh, that was the one thing my mom had asked for. And then somebody, um, as far as I know, we still don't know who, somebody put a, it's like a, it's taller than him. He's six feet tall and it's, it's taller than him. A big, like, I, it looks like it's a wooden kind of cutout of a teddy bear in the front of their, in front of their house with a sign that's like happy 80th birthday or something. It's, it's something else. Um, there's a, uh, she said a nice picture, or she posted a nice picture of my, my dad next to it. And it. They still don't know where it came from. She texted me, she's like, did you send the bear, the teddy bear? And I'm like, no, I didn't send the teddy bear. I was like, what are you talking about, teddy bear? And then she <laughs> saw the picture, I was like, whoa, that is something else, so. Uh, yeah, so that was a joy. Although, uh, also a concern, he he um, is continuing to lose weight. Uh, he went to the doctor this uh, this week as well, and um, he's also down a bit in weight. And they're gonna, um, you know, they're still working on you know, different kinds of you know, adjusting medications and treatments for him. Um, he was evaluated by a hospice nurse, but um, he they, they he wasn't he didn't qualify for that just yet and I think my my parents were not you know not quite ready for that yet but maybe within a couple years it, it might be a, something that's going to happen so I appreciate prayers for them Norma well, it, it, moving is stressful yeah so prayers for Janine as she's preparing for this move um, the stressful process to get everything together for that and and also, especially when you're that age and you're not, you hadn't expected to move again. You thought, this is just, this is where I am until I'm done. And, and it's not. So it's, it's a big deal. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So at the other end, they're putting an addition on her daughter's house. Um, for her, so there's a whole lot going on there too, and with contractors and all the, all the things that go into that, and hopefully, we pray that everything goes um, under budget, on time, and good quality. How's that? Yes. Yeah, I imagine. Um, yeah, that's a good prayer. This is a prayer for our for our our church here. Um, we're having to. Uh, we're in the process of trying to get bids to to fix and get working and probably upgrade our fire alarm system here, um, uh, especially because we have a couple of preschools that meet here. So, um, but getting 
quotes back is is proving difficult. We've only got one so far, and it was pretty outrageous amounts. So um, prayers that will get other bids and that they will be good. Um, God, show us favor in front of whoever the people who are making the decisions about what we need and how much and and so on that um, that we can yeah that we can do it and make this place safe safer safer than it's been since at least the mid nineties right because the thing hasn't worked <laughs> the system hasn't worked in a long time um, yeah we can also be praying our uh, we uh, we have a cell tower here, and and uh, we're having another AT and T is going to tie in on it, and so we're just praying that that all goes smoothly too, because that'll that might uh, that'll bring in a little more revenue, maybe help us pay for that that alarm system. So um, okay, well, that's good. Yes, all right. So thank God that things worked out for your car that. The weather stripping all popped off in the middle of this hundred hundred and eleven degree heat. I, I could put it back in the channel for half that. Okay. I'll push it back in there. Oh, so no estimate. Which is illegal, so yeah. All right. Well praise God that corporate is on the case, and you're going to get reimbursed for that. But I pray that businesses would be, behave ethically. Yes. Speaking of weather, though, I'm glad you brought you mentioned that. Uh, that reminds me of two things. One is praise God, it is not over 100 degrees today. In fact, it's cool enough that we just have the doors open. I don't even have the AC on, um, and it it rained a little bit, which is, I imagine, a very welcome development for the uh, major wildfires that we have had um, right around here with, with the line fire and the bridge fire, both kind of in our neighborhood, I don't know. I think somewhere in the middle of this last week, I was coming home and it was, it was just after dark, and I could actually see the fire, I could see the fire up on the hills, up just well, north of Upland. Weird, yeah, Baldy Village lost, was it 20 or 30? Homes, almost thirty homes, and then uh, and then just some kind of uh, cabins out in the forest, and uh, a few other buildings. I think in Wrightwood, there were some a few structures there too. Yeah. So um, prayers that the the firefighters will be able to get the fires under control uh, more than they are, and and pray that this weather will hold to help them help them out. It is supposed to rain tonight. Okay, that's. That's very good news for them. I'm sure they're thrilled to because uh, that'll help tamp things down because those fires got big fast. Uh, I think it started, one of them, I know, started uh, Sunday afternoon, last Sunday. By the evening, it was up to 127 acres or something, and within a couple of days, it was, it was tens of thousands of acres. So. And um, prayers for all the all of us who have various kinds of lung issues that with all the smoke in the air, the air quality has not been good. So pray for anybody suffering with asthma or <clears throat> a little bit of, uh, let's say, uh, long COVID shortness of breath or any other lung conditions. We've had to kind of do our best to stay out of the smoke. So, okay, so another fire down in Orange County. Um, calling it the airport fire because it's kind of heading toward John Wayne Airport a bit, but it's taken out, would you said 65 homes already? So that's, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Well, yeah. Okay, so we'll be praying for the people of Palos Verdes as the ground is literally shifting under their feet a foot a week, and they don't know why. That is, that's disturbing. Yeah. So people are losing gas and electric, and okay, yeah, that's not that's very not very much not good. Well, let's pray. God, there is so much going on. This has been a year that's just been really full of 
things happen. Wars, which we didn't even mention today, wars that continue, political situations that lead to devastation sometimes. We have people we know who are in transition, moving, healing, folks who have lost loved ones. We pray particularly for the community of Springfield, Ohio, as they deal with all the fallout from um, what Donald Trump said during the debate based on J.D. Vance's uh, pushing of these uh, malicious gossip, racist, xenophobic rumors. God, help us to be people who answer the prayers of your people in our actions, in our lives, in our attitudes. Guide us to more fully embody and embrace your justice, your love, your righteousness in this world. We offer all these things to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Today's reading is from Exodus 32, <coughs> verses 9 through 19. And the Lord said to Moses, I have been watching these people, and I have seen how, situ <coughs> how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone. Let my, my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, and with great power and amazing force? Why should the Egyptians say he had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and so wipe them off the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing terrible things to your own people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants whom you yourself promised. I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I promise to give you descendants in this whole land to possess for all time. Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible things he had said about the children of Israel and what he would do to its people. Moses then turned around and came down the mountain. He carried the two covenant tablets in his hands. The tablets were written on both sides, front and back. The tablets were God's own work. What was written there was God's own writing, inscribed on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, It sounds like a war in the camp. But Moses said, It isn't the sound of a victory song. It isn't the sound of a defeat. The sound of party songs is what I hear. When he got near the camp and saw the bull calf and dancing, Moses was furious. He hurled the tablets down and shattered them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people disrespect me, and how long will they doubt me after all the signs that I've performed among them? I'll strike them down with a plague and disown them. Then I'll make you into a great, greater, stronger nation. Moses said to the Lord, The Egyptians will hear, for you with your power you brought these people up from among them. They'll tell the inhabitants of this land. They've heard that you, Lord, are with this people. You, Lord, appear to, face, <clears throat> appear to them face to face. Your cloud stands over them. You go before them in a column of a cloud by day and a column of lightning by night. If you kill these people, everyone laughs at them. The nations who heard about you will say, the Lord wasn't able to bring these people out of the land that he solemnly promised to give them. He slaughtered them in the desert. Now, let my master's power be as great as you declared when you said, The Lord is very patient and absolutely loyal, forgiving wrongs and disloyalty. Yet he doesn't forego all punishment, disciplining the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren for their ancestors' wrongs. 
Please forgive the wrongs of these people because of your absolute loyalty, just as you've forgiven those people from their time in Egypt until now. And then the Lord said, I will forgive them as you have requested. So uh, we're continuing the series on uh, governance and um, uh, leadership. Yeah, uh, but I, this passage in particular, there's a couple of shouts back to our previous series, I think, on biblical humor. And so uh, there might be a little bit of that worked in here. Um, and if it felt a little repetitious, did it feel like just a little repetitious? You heard the same thing a couple different times? That's because you did, basically. Um, so what Mike read for us was from uh, Exodus 32, which is the golden calf story, right? This is a story where the, uh, they're at the mountain. They had received the Ten Commandments from God. The people heard the Ten Commandments from God, sent Moses up the mountain because they were too freaked out by that. So that Mo he's like, they said, you go up here and get the rest of the commandments. We'll just wait down here. Gets to be about six weeks later, and he still hasn't come back, so they start you know, they make this golden calf and start worshiping it. And understandably, the Lord gets a bit angry about that. And then he read from Numbers 14, which is another story. This is where they've now made it to the promised land. They're at the edge, and they send in some spies to go check it out. And the spies check it out, and they come back, and all the spies agree it's a good land. It's a rich land. It's flowing with milk and honey. Not literally, because that would be a sticky mess, but it's, a, it's an image of the abundance of the land, um, cultivated and uncultivated. And, um, but then 10 of the 12 say, but <laughs> the cities were so big and fortified and they had huge walls and the people were enormous. Some of them were giants freak this out we would like grasshoppers in front of them two of them though were like caleb and joshua no god has given us this land let's go take it uh, but the people listened to the ten instead of the two and once again god became angry and so both of these stories are examples of times when the people didn't trust god they turned away from god and god decided I'm done with these people. I'm going to destroy them. In both stories. I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses, I'll start over with you. Start over with you. One thing I want to point out with uh, in the Exodus 32 passage, and I, I, there's no way I was going to add more to what Mike read, so... Uh, I'll read this one, but two verses before where he started. The Lord spoke to Moses, Hurry up and go down. Your people, who you, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, are ruining everything. So, that's the Lord. Your people, who you brought out of Egypt, are ruining everything. Just a few verses later. That was verse 7. Now we're in verse... We go down to verse 11. Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and amazing force? Did you catch that? When the Lord was complaining about the people, the Lord said, Moses, your people are doing this thing. Your people who you brought out of Egypt and then Moses turns around and says, Lord, your people who you brought out of Egypt are doing this thing. It really reminds me of like, uh, like uh, bickering parents. It's like, you just wait till you're, you know, so-and-so gets home and, you know, one of them comes in. And, you won't believe what your son did. My son. You know, it's like blame. They're blame I love it. It's like they're blaming each other. It's like they're an old bickering old couple or something, you know, God and Moses. Like, your people are really screwing up. Yeah, your people. It's like, don't, none of them want them. They don't want these people. 
but God's anger burns against them. And God wants to destroy them. God is so angry. This could be the end of Israel right here. The Old Testament could have gotten just a whole lot shorter right there. But it didn't. And what I want to look at is why it didn't. Why didn't God destroy the people there? And it's because of the leadership of Moses. See, I did tie it back to our theme here, governance and leadership. Because look at what Moses does in both cases, right? Leave me alone. This is what God says. Leave me alone. Let my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. And Moses' response is, Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people, whom you brought out of Egypt? Okay, yes, it's funny, but it's also, you did this, you know, you brought these people out. Why, why are you so angry at them? And then he says, why should the Egyptians say he had a plan, an evil plan, to take him out and kill him in the desert? In other words, and, and, and Moses uses the same argument again in Numbers 14. The, the Egyptians will hear, for with your power you brought these people up from among them. They'll tell the inhabitants of this land. They've heard about you, so on and so forth. Um, you brought them out and all this. If you kill these people, every last one of them, the nations who heard about you will say, the Lord wasn't able to bring these people to the land he solemnly promised. So Moses' first tack here is to go at God's reputation. It's like, God, if you take these people who you brought out of being enslaved and you just bring them out into the desert with an evil plan to kill them there, the Egyptians are going to hear about it. Other people are going to hear about it. And next thing you know, people are going to be unfriending you, unfollowing you, and that'll be the end of it. So appealing to God's reputation. You can't do this because it's going to reflect poorly on you. But that's not the only argument here. He goes on, because he's got more. He said, you made a promise. Just a few verses later, this is in the Exodus 23, or, or 32. He says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you promised I will Make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. I've promised to give your descendants this whole land and to possess it for all time. So first, your reputation is going to suffer. Second, you made a promise. Got to hold you to your promise. Right? Well, what is Moses doing here? As a leader, he's standing up against authority. Right? Standing up against the biggest authority, the highest authority you could possibly imagine, God, and saying, wait, you can't do that. I, I would hazard a guess that most people don't think that that's a model for how we should talk to God. Right? This is not how we're usually taught. It's like, I am a worm, I'm confessing my sins, and so on. It's not, God, no, you can't do that. You're people. You can't destroy your people. You have to help us out here because you are a God of justice. You are a God of forgiveness. Oh, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the next argument. Go to Numbers 14. Moses makes yet another argument. He says, now let my master's power be as great as you declared when you said the Lord is very patient and absolutely loyal, forgiving wrongs and disloyalty. Yet he doesn't forgo all punishment, disciplining the children, grandchildren and the great-grandchildren for the ancestors' wrongs. Please forgive the wrongs of these people. So here, Moses, here this is really clever. This is Numbers 14. Right, Moses is saying, God, you said that you are a gracious and compassionate God, that you are patient 
and forgiving. And so forgive your people. Well, now, when did, when did God say that? God said that right after the golden calf. Right back after the golden calf, God decides, okay, I won't destroy them. And Moses says, I need some reassurance that you're actually going to go with us. So I want to see you. And so Moses, you know, he puts Moses in this little crack in the mountain, and he's like, you can, you know, I'll pass by and proclaim my name Yahweh. And so God does. God, this dramatic moment, this is in Exodus 34, uh, 6 and following, God passes by and says, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God gracious and compassionate, patient and uh, forgiving of sins to the third and, or to the thousandth generation, proclaims this big statement of who God is. We don't get things like that in the Bible much at all. Like God saying, here's who I am. And now Moses, in Numbers 14 later, is using God's own words to say, look, you said this is how you are, so be that. Forgive. So Moses, as a leader, is standing up to authority, and he's using techniques, he's using language that will appeal to authority. If you think about it, if you want to get something out of somebody in power, showing how the decisions they're making are going to affect their reputation, that could be an effective strategy. I mean, imagine politicians, right? You question their reputation, they might get on board with what you're, what you're trying to sell, <laughs> right? Your reputation's going to suffer if you keep this up. Hmm, maybe I should rethink this, right? You made a promise. I mean, maybe the politicians aren't the best example on that one. <laughs> Campaign promises are like famously not kept, but, uh, but if you can hold somebody to what they have said, right? God, you said you're a gracious and compassionate God, forgiving and so on. If you can bring up a leader's own words against them and say, look, you said this. Have you not changed your position? Have you flip-flopped? Are you going to follow through on what you said? And God does. In both cases. In Exodus 32, it says, Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible things he had said he would do to his people. God changed God's mind because of what Moses said. Think about that a moment. Let that sink in. Moses argued God out of destroying the people. And it says God changed his mind. That tells us a couple things. One, we have a God who is willing to change. We have a God who is willing to respond to us. A God who is compassionate and loving enough to bend. It also means that we have a God who is open to being challenged. A God who wants us to stand up and speak out for those God is uh, perhaps not so pleased with. God wants us to stand up for the powerless. God wants justice. But God is also open to forgiving. Numbers 14, it's very simple. The Lord said, I will forgive as you requested. As you requested. Prayer is not useless. You know, we're not all Moses. We're not going to go in the tent and see God face to face and come out glowing afterwards, but we don't have to be. A good leader stands up for the people, a good leader fights for the people, a good leader stands up to 
powers and authorities of this world and says, enough, enough, justice, compassion, righteousness. These are the things that need to be upheld. In the face of the fear of destruction, the leader says, no. The people are afraid. The leader says, hope. The leader looks to God and says, help. And God responds to that leader. Let's pray. God, thank you for these stories where Moses was so bold as to stand up to you <laughs> and uh, perhaps put his own life on the line here a bit, risk himself for the sake of the people. Thank you, God, for leaders who are willing to stand up for others, who are willing to intercede with the powers that be. And thank you, God, for being a God of grace and compassion, a forgiving God who doesn't acquit the guilty completely, but also has compassion on all. We give you thanks in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Now, as we prepare to come to Christ's table, I uh, invite us to sing, My Hope is Built. Welcome to Christ's table. It is at Christ's table we come to meet our risen and forever Lord and to commune with God and with one another. On that night so long ago, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. 
Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he took a cup, and again he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, b'rei p'ri ha'gaf, and blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And I tell you the truth, I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God, for the people of God. today is great is thy faithfulness and as we sing this is our opportunity to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to the God who is faithful to us who is compassionate and forgiving and a bringer of justice and life so let us sing
And now as we go, may God be above us to watch over us. May God be beneath us to lift us up. May God be ahead of us to lead us. May God be behind us to push us. May God be beside us to walk with us. And may God be within us to love us forever. Amen.